the only that I come with. I know he hates it. The black guy. I I am not a fan of Will I Am. Will I Am's unique. Did you? And I appreciate unique artistry. Oh, that's a beautiful way to put it. Did you see during the um, was it the last presidential election, not this one, but the one before of where like Will I Am was a hologram. And they were like, yeah. making this big deal out of the CNN. What was that for? It was CNN. CNN's just like, hey, this is a hologram. But it wasn't really, you know. It was a hologram the same way that, like, in movies. There was... They introduced somebody wrong. During the presidential? Yeah. Thing. And I think it was William, but they were calling him something else. <laughs> Oh, wouldn't wouldn't surprise me. So um, I don't know. Like, I guess all black people look the same. Yeah, we. I mean, we could dive in exactly into that part of the conversation. <laughs> I um, I feel like now more than than ever, uh, news is in is kind of a under scrutiny, which I think is like mm-hmm. good in some ways. But some of the like uh. I don't know, like, when I hear someone say fake news now, it's like, it's like nails on a chalkboard, because it's, it's not used in a way of saying, like, the information that is given is bad, it's yeah, like, inaccurate. I, uh-huh. yeah, it's, I don't like this, right, which are two, two different things, but that's, we can go on that subject as, as much as we want, but I guess for, first, we should probably introduce the, the listeners to, to who you are, so would you like to introduce yourself? I would love to. Um, my name is Andrew Alleman. And, um, I am an individual in the community that does a lot of different things. So I work at UNO, doing compliance work. Um, I'm a part-time mental health therapist. And then I sit on a couple boards, um, for nonprofit organizations here in Omaha. So that's fun. So UNO, for the listeners, if you're not familiar with that, that is Uni- University of Nebraska at Omaha. And yeah, compliance work doesn't sound riveting, right? It doesn't. <laughs> Super when you say, exciting. I I do <laughs> I do constitutional compliance. Uh, I I you know what? Just, I make sure we follow the law as yeah, a university. That's fun. I I just realized um, I didn't put two and two together, but yeah, the last time I saw you is you were doing a presentation um, about oh, yeah. about Title Nine, mm-hmm. right? For uh, an educator's breakfast, and I I learned some things there that I guess I didn't realize. Mm-hmm. So one is just how um, non-specific the verbiage in oh, yeah. in Title IX is. So I know like we're kicking off the podcast on a on a riveting foot, right? Let's talk about it's exciting. Let's talk about Title IX. But um, is that I, I think some people get afraid of sending their kids to college because they just they hear things like oh they have to have a uh, a person there who's who's trying to make sure all this like sexual harassment and stuff doesn't happen. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know. Wait, what's your usual reaction when you tell people this is uh, your job? Um, well, usually people's first reaction when I say that I do Title IX work is what is Title IX? Mm-hmm. Then I have to explain to them what it is. And then um, usually their response is, that must be difficult. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> And so, I don't know. I mean, obviously, I've done a lot of difficult work in various fields. I think there's a perception that you send kids to college and people are just getting raped all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that is kind of the the message that has been put out and how we're trying to get people to be passionate about Title IX and, and passionate about um, victim rights. Um and might that be the story for a very small select few of campuses? Maybe. Um, I would say the biggest thing that I personally deal with is just young people in really difficult relationships. Mm-hmm. I mean, that is majority of my job. So young people that are in controlling relationships or um, abusive relationships or, you know, and just helping people navigate that stuff versus a ton of sexual assault. Yeah. I would say that that is not a majority of what I I handle, um, or at least comes my way. Mostly, it's just relationships that are impacting people's ability to be successful in school. You know, and that, that for some people, I think they would say that, like, well, why is the school involved in in something like that? Um, there's a lot of things that you said there that I know people listening probably have a, a ton of questions about, or. Um, I would even say all the way down to use the word victim in there. And I know some people don't like that word in there. And I, yeah. there's, there's... I actually don't typically mm-hmm. say the word. But, yeah, I mean, there's different things where it's victim, survivor. Um, 
you know, in my world, everything is very legalistic. So yeah, it's like complainant sense. and respondent. Um, yeah. But I think that's just the easiest way. Or I just say somebody who has had this happen to them. Yeah. So I, and another thing I think this um, looks at or, or calls to is the Me Too movement. But I can, I can just see some people saying like, well, what do, what do two, uh, like cis men, you know, have to say about the, the Me Too movement, but we're both social workers also. Mm -hmm. So I know like, like you uh, mentioned that you deal a lot with these difficult relationships on the college level. I, I deal with it with a lot of high schoolers and even, um, recently have had a couple of students of similar, um, going through, uh, controlling relationship trying to break up a controlling relationship trying to do all those things and man is it i think it's a lot scarier than people can can imagine someone who's never been in that mm-hmm. situation uh just because you think you don't really realize how much like how scary it can be that someone that you cared about a relationship wants if they want to harm you like there's there's only so many barriers you can put in place there mm-hmm. right because a lot of people don't realize that police are reactive right police are reactive you you call them when something's in progress, right? Mm-hmm. It's hard to get things in motion before anything has happened because a lot of times what, what they'll say is just like, well, cut off contact, get a protection order, but protection order is a piece of paper, mm-hmm. right? So what's going to happen there? So I, um, you know, obviously not not violating FERPA, right? Which is, what what does FERPA stand for? I can't remember. All these acronyms yeah. in, in social work things, but without giving out people's information, it's like what, on the co- uh, on the college level, what does that look like? Mm-hmm. Well, and I think first, so you said a couple things that made me think of some stuff. So first, I think sometimes in this narrative, we we forget that um, it's more than just like cis women that mm-hmm. have this experience. Mm-hmm. Um, cis men, also I've worked with cis men um, who have been in controlling relationships, um, LGBTQ folks we forget to talk about in this narrative. So I think that that's also important but um yeah what does it look like at a college level i mean our our responsibility is not the legal is not the the criminal responsibility and i Mm -hmm. think that's what people want us to do they want us to be the um the people that find justice and all of that and and our role is to make sure that each student has a successful and equitable opportunity at an education i mean that's what it is so it's it's not as exciting as I think people want it to be. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> it's not like law and it's order. Not, yeah. Right? I mean, it's, it's not law and order style. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Mm-hmm. That's just that. Um, so I, I listened to, to something a little bit earlier and I know we, we had talked uh, off, um, not off camera, I guess, but off mic a couple times about really what were we going to speak about today <laughs> Uh, I know me and you. You were you were at my last the last podcast also, um, talking about uh, things regarding the race. And I, I was listening to something earlier today, and it was um, someone asking asking Neil deGrasse Tyson um, about his and he's astrophysicist. He's the director of the Hayden Planetarium in in New York. Um, he had he had the the series Cosmos. Uh, so pretty, pretty famous scientist and, uh, this interviewer asked him, um, like, did he, did he usually talk about race? Did he not? And and I can't really say, you know, everyone deals with race in their own way, but for him, he very much said he wanted to focus on different issues than that. And that the last time he had spoken about that, I think was in the, uh, in the nineties, he had, he had made some comment, um, when asked about it. And something for me, and maybe he just comes from a different generation, because for me, I think I've grown up in a generation of where it's been like, if, if people want to talk about race, you, should, you shouldn't you should back down about it. You mm-hmm. should get out in front of it, and you should be nuanced about it, and you should um, be ready to, to talk about it and, and go out there. So hearing him say that, I mean, he's, he's wildly successful. I mean, he's, it's because of him that Pluto isn't considered a planet anymore. So Mm. how many, (laughs) how many people can, can say that? And I don't remember the whole story, but I also heard that like the first name for, for Uranus was George because it was like a placeholder name because of, because of, uh, the English, I, I think. Um, so I don't, I don't know. 
So yeah, I you think you've people... had a lot of time to think about this since we first like, talked about it. So what have have you like what have you pinged around in your head before even getting to sit down here and talk? Yeah, I mean, I think first of all, I think people don't talk about race because it's uncomfortable to talk about. Um, I think people don't talk about race because because then we have to face our own biases um we have to face the things that we do day to day that um keep people of color out of successful positions and that requires people to take sacrifices within their own successes and people don't want to do that (laughs) that makes them uncomfortable and that's other people of color too sometimes Mm -hmm. um and so i i think it's not a fun topic for people to talk about i used to hate talking about it. And I, and I think something that really sat with me to talk about today was just identity. Um, and just my life, how race and, um, sexuality, um, and just as a biracial person, just the different intersections of my life that have had a big impact on what I do and a big impact on how I, look at the world, how the world looks me. And so it just, it's had such a big impact that it's something that I, I don't know, wanted to talk more about today. Yeah. So I, um, I, and I tell us all the time, I've said it many times, I think on, uh, the last podcast, but, and probably people hear me say this a lot now is that, um, I'm, I'm not thrilled to talk about race. Um, (laughs) But it's a conversation that what I feel was thrust on me at a very young age. My first, the first time that um, someone let me know that I wasn't uh, part of the majority race was when I was five years old, um, and I had a few kids who were being mean to me just because uh, they were calling me brown boy. Which you know, at this age, like if someone called me that, I'd be like, okay, you know, <laughs> what what else do you have to say? But when you're five years old, and that's the reason people don't want to play with you, it was. Apparently, according to my mother, it was, it was devastating to me. So, um, I yeah. don't know, was, was your, did you get a, a gentler introduction to race, or, or was it something similar? I think I didn't like talking about race either, because I was always raised to believe if there's something I wanted, I just needed to work hard to get it. Mm-hmm. And that is the narrative I was given. Okay. And so, and I think that's the narrative we do give people, because... If we talk about race, then we have to recognize that race has an impact on the way that we get around in the world. Yeah. Um, And I don't think people want you to know that. So I think it's also like a social construct to to not talk about race. Mm -hmm. It's it's this faux pas, you know, and um, that's why I love it now, because I've, I've recognized that how that has impacted my life. And, you know, so I was raised, um, my mother's Cuban and she's very white passing. Mm. Um, and I don't know my biological father and, um, he's black. And so then my, who I call my dad, um, is a white man. And, and was in the military. So I think that's very much the life that we lived. I think it was mm. just easier to kind of follow that life. A lot of our Cuban roots and aspects of our life um, kind of disappeared a little bit. And and I think for my mom, she held them very close. Um, and they definitely came out in different areas. But I don't know how much they filtered down to myself and my brother. Um, and so that... I think I, I lived very much in that that society of, well, you just work hard and you'll get all the things that you want in life. Yeah. Um, and that's only true to a point, I feel. Yeah, there, there's so much inside <laughs> of it. And, and I think you have a... You give people a lot of credit, I think, of when you say that like people avoid the conversation about race because or else they'd have to admit some hard things. I, I honestly think that... Um, a lot of people just don't think about it because they don't have to think about it. And sure. then agreed. And I'm sure, and I'm sure you've had a similar experience. Cause I know, uh, I have, of when someone says something that is 
maybe not obviously racist, but is but is in some way. And I just happen to know because either my own lived experiences or just the the field that that I've been in, and I'll just let them know, hey, here's why I see this as racist, and then they want to grill me about it or they want to 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 tell me why it's not right. And it's a frustrating thing to be in. I actually had that uh, moment with a with a friend recently of where I said like, you know what, can you just believe me mm-hmm. on this one? Right. Um, and so I don't know. And it must be, it must've been different for you because you were in a household. And I guess maybe the, the idea of to fit into that whiteness is that's kind of the cultural default here in the United States. Um, but I don't know now that you're no longer, uh, a child and that you no longer have to, and I, and I know that, uh, we, we're similar age. Um, I found a lot of times with my parents, I have to, it's a different lens now where it's like an adult talking to an adult. And, uh, I have a great relationship with my mother of where I can kind of push back on some things, but even some things about race, you know, and I, and I think even the other day, and I, I love my mother dearly, but she's not perfect, just like none of us are perfect. And she was telling a story about uh in the 70s when she went to go see um like a martial arts film with my dad somewhere and she she told a story and she says we went to this theater and in the front row there were three negroes and i said uh mom that's mm-hmm. just that's not normal nomenclature that we don't use that anymore yeah uh, and she said and my mom is older my mom is my mom's uh i think she's 76 now right and she said like oh, you don't have to correct me every time i do that and i was like yeah mom like i just want and my brother just kind of said like just like oh you sound like like your mother like our grandma right um and but it's just one of those moments of where i felt comfortable saying like hey mom you know like that's just not mm-hmm. just not what we say anymore what well and i think what's that it like with, with your family well i think first i think that that's a lot more of what i feel like the norm is which is why i give people the credit mm-hmm. um because i think that it's a conscious choice. Mm -hmm. Um, It is too difficult to get around in this world and not realize that there are indifferences. Yeah. Um, And I'm not going to sit here and and truly authentically believe that people don't see it. I think people see it, but they choose not to see it and they choose not to react to it because then that means something. That means what they're seeing is true. Mm -hmm. Um, it's I just I just don't buy the fact that people don't see. Do I think there's maybe a small percentage of people that just honestly don't see it? Sure, but I th- I think it's a choice. I think people consciously choose not to see the racism that is very much alive um, within our our societies and all structures of our life. So you know I I think that's why I give people the credit because I think that they deserve to be credited for choosing not to act on it. Oh God, I don't, I, I felt very sure of where I stood on this, but hearing you say that, cause I want to agree with you, but I also, I think, and I don't know if it's just for me, maybe I'm naive. Um, I just want to believe that most people are ignorant, but really how can you be so ignorant in this, in this day and age? And that's why like, I don't know, but and think this, of how many times people are like, Oh, I wasn't alive when there were slaves. Mm-hmm. Right. So that's what people jump to. People know that there have been injustices and that they, continue to be there Mm -hmm. um but they only want to look at that one thing only look at slavery and when that ended all injustices ended (laughs) and that's just not reality oh man i don't know how many times i've i've had you know because and you knew me at at the time where i worked for an organization where i got i I felt very lucky to get in front of rooms with people and really be able to have those hard conversations and get in there and i don't know how many times it would be that someone uh in the room would bring up slavery and then mm-hmm. someone would would chime in and say like do you do you know that the the first slave uh the first slaves were the irish mm-hmm. or the first the first slaves were bought by a black man you know uh inside of here and it's oh my gosh and the thing is i guess we could we could go through all those but i'm mm-hmm. honestly i'm just tired about it in life yeah. you know because i've yeah. had that conversation so many times so and a lot of times i end conversations that i know i'm not gonna get anywhere with where i just tell people just like just google it please just, yeah just, just mm-hmm. please just google it because all that information is out there yeah. um but i would say that 
I don't know, because here's, here's a question. I think everyone's looking for a silver bullet. Is when you are a person of color mm-hmm. and hard moments like that come up with friends, mm-hmm. how, how should one deal with it? So I don't know. Do you have any good examples, instances of where you've had to deal with that? Well, and, and I don't think that all people recognize all of the injustices and, and, and understand the true impact Mm-hmm. And, I, and I think oftentimes that's what us people of color are wanting people to see is not that there is an injustice, but what is the impact of that injustice? And I don't think people can see that as much because they aren't experiencing it. They don't and they never will understand that impact. Um, for me, I think if people feel safe and comfortable addressing it with a friend, they should. Um, I don't think that us... Um, people of color should always have to be the people that are providing that education for people. Um, you know, I think there's people like you and I, um, who have put ourselves in Mm. the position before. And when we are putting ourselves in that position, I think that's a different story for me. I think I usually start with letting people know what that impact is for me. So I don't really care what your intention was behind what you said, Mm -hmm. this is what the impact was. And that's what I want people to know. I mean, I could care less why somebody did or did not do Mm -hmm. something. It's understand the impact of, of your words and your actions. So, um, and I think it's a rare opportunity to have someone in here. Uh, I can ask a question that I ping around in my head every once in a while, but, um, since you are licensed as a mental health practitioner (laughs) and I, um, Mm -hmm. I have my provisional license, and so I, um, and I have I have a copy of the DSM, the Diagnostic Manual uh, mm-hmm. from the American Psychological Association. I have a pocket version that I also keep there. A lot of times, it's just a prop for students to try to say like, "Hey, there's nothing wrong with you. Look, this is, mm-hmm. you know, we can we have X-rays for if you break a bone, but we just don't have the technology for that yet." But um, every once in a while, I think about like, what is the future of of like racial or otherwise uh identity based like statements or actions that hurt people based on that and i think that me and you know that the the dsm has had a lot of wacky things inside of it added and and taken away that have been put in or out and i just think that i wonder at some point in the future if like things like uh identity based like attacks or statements will be yeah. inside of there listed under antisocial behavior, right? Because mm-hmm. it is when someone says something that's that's blatantly racist, that is antisocial behavior and it does impact a lot of their ability. But for some people, and I know stick with me for a little bit because this, this is a weird uh, – <laughs> these are the things I think about when I, when I don't have uh, clients coming to me. Um, but for some people, that that like racial hate or things like that is a social – a uh, trait that binds them together, and that's something that in my studies of of white supremacist groups that I that I've done for a few years is that they believe that they are the ones who are fighting against this Jewish cabal that is can control controlling everything. So in some ways, it is a social binder. So then it comes to the to the thing of is is racism just a human characteristic, and so they say don't pathologize human behavior right which is don't try to add some type of clinical significance to something that isn't that is just a human behavior so does that mean that racism sexism all those things are they just human behavior so i'd like to hear your thoughts on that because i've i've lived trapped inside yeah i know that is a question (laughs) um first i want to make sure i'm not misrepresenting Mm -hmm. myself uh, not uh, misrepresenting myself, but mm-hmm. I, so I am still provisionally licensed, but here soon mm-hmm. I will be fully licensed. Okay. Yeah. I thankfully. know the struggle. I, I know. know the struggle. Um, early 2018. Yeah. Um, so I think it's important to remember why the DSM exists to begin with. Um, mm-hmm. and, and really a lot of that is dictated by, what insurance companies will pay for um, to provide people access to quality mental health care. So 
So remember that everything that is in there isn't necessarily abnormal. Mm -hmm. Um, I I think, you know, anxiety is in there and a lot of people experience anxiety Mm -hmm. and a lot of people experience depression and there's various levels of depression represented within the DSM. So, so do I think that racism is diagnosable is almost what I Mm -hmm. kind of hear as an undertone. Mm -hmm. Um, do I think somebody could find a way to make it diagnosable? Sure. sure. <laughs> um, we're we're going off of something that is 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 based to to make money and to to dictate who can have access to things or not. And it, and it also helps people understand different disorders and where to go from there and how to help that. But I think we can do that in a way without having to. Um, put a label on somebody Mm -hmm. so sure i mean i think that certain actions that people take who are racist probably are diagnosable do i think all people that are racist i don't know i mean i know there's clinicians out there that are listening they're like yes mm -hmm, yes Mm -hmm. absolutely um i wouldn't necessarily say that but Mm -hmm. but i but once again the things in the dsm aren't abnormal necessarily um there are some things that are less normal or less um frequent but so so the things that we're seeing that are causing trouble in the world every day are are still things that probably are reflected in some way well and i guess because you know there are tests um that that uh, measure. I don't want to say anxiety. measure bias. Yeah, yeah they they, they oh, do things bi- like yeah. that. Uh, biases, things like that. What mm-hmm. I'm saying is, do you, do you think that one day it could be seen as clinically significant to impeding someone's life enough that it, it people would rate it as clinically significant? Simply being someone who is racist or displays those racist mm-hmm. traits. No, because I don't think anybody would ever buy that that is a problem. That's not something that us as a society have chosen to ostracize, that us as a society have chosen to stigmatize. Yeah. Well, that's um, I'm once saying, something, like, I mean, think about it. Like, 100 years in the future. Um, I don't know. I don't I think so. Because I think our, our, our entire country and nation has been um founded on on only providing a select group of people access Mm -hmm. so i think racism has been alive forever i don't know that i feel like it'll go away i think we can control the different aspects of it and the impacts of it um but i don't think it'll ever go away or be seen as truly as something because you we have to think of how racism evolves Mm -hmm. um you know there are still people that are very like openly blatantly outwardly racist (laughs) but i think we have now gone to a way of of doing that subliminally or doing it in a way that we can can hide it and cover it up so I think until we decide that it truly is a problem and we choose to stigmatize it, you know, smoking, nicotine addiction wasn't necessarily a thing yeah. before, but now we stigmatize people who smoke or caffeine addiction. We mm. talk about the effects of caffeine more now. So uh, so those type of things, I think, have come up because they impact doctors. There's nothing that we can, yeah. uh, there's nothing that we can give a pill for or that we can have a doctor treat for racism. So mm-hmm. once again, remembering why the DSM was created and why those structures are put into place, it's for money and it's for access. And racism isn't something that is going, you're going to be able to give somebody a pill for. So I, yeah. I don't think it'll ever be something that's diagnosable. That makes me feel better. Do like, I think there's they, things wrong you, with people? Absolutely, but yeah. I don't. I... Well, he, and then here's another thing: is beyond it being clinically um, in there, if we're talking socially, I guess if you would have asked me, if you would have asked me two years ago, could someone who just who says blatantly racist things ever be president? I would say no, hundred percent no. <laughs> we are way past that as a I nation. I would have probably agreed with you. Well, yeah, yeah, <laughs> which is. 
But, like, but we, actually, maybe I wouldn't have, actually. I don't know. Yeah. See, and the thing is, I, uh, so my partner and I had, had a bet on, um, the, the race in Alabama, uh, and she said that she thought Roy Moore was going to win, mm-hmm. and so I think, um, if she won, I had to buy her ramen, and I said, I think Doug Jones is going to win, mm-hmm. not because I think he's going to win, but I have to believe. I have to have some faith. I have mm-hmm. to have. I just have to, for my own sanity. I have to do it. Um, and I got ice cream out of that, so it all it all worked out. But where do you think that? Because 2018 midterms are coming up here. Um, do you think that? And it looks like that. Like people, people like Roy Moore across the country would probably suffer some big losses. Do you think? And you said like racism evolves. Do you think that? Like in 2020, will that play a factor? And maybe not 2020, but like 2024 and all those things. Um, and politics is a weird creature, but yeah. I would say even politics as they – because one thing I've noticed before here, and the reason I bring up the uh, politics a lot is because I see it in people. Mm-hmm. I see how it changes. I've never felt more disconnected, I, I'd say, more disconnected from white people than I ever have this year, mm-hmm. ever. It's been it's been really weird. How is, like, I don't know, how's it been for you lately in this last year, this last 10 years that has been 2017, mm-hmm. yeah, right? This last, <laughs> yeah, well, and I think um, also remembering how we vote for people. So if if everybody had to publicly stand in front of their peers and say, this is who I'm voting for. I don't know that that Trump would have won. That's such a good point. Um, but we are able to hide behind that. So once again, we are choosing more passive ways to be racist. We're choosing more more subliminal ways to have somebody else control what the impact of racism will be and i'm using racism really as as an umbrella term but what that impact will be among people of color and so that that is a huge aspect that people get to hide behind it once again saying that that people recognize Mm -hmm. but they they choose not to do anything about it or act on it or address it Mm -hmm. um or step away from some of their privilege. I mean, you and I both have um, the opportunity and grace to be around some white folks who really get it and and work really hard and still make mistakes, but but really work hard to let go of some of their privilege to address those injustices and they also work to give up some of that privilege but what has this last 10 years of a year been like for me (laughs) um you know i had to do a lot of self-reflection and kind of step away from the ranting on facebook and reading all of that to really find where my place is in all of this Mm -hmm. and and what I think and believe about everything, it's really hard because, I mean, people's lives are impacted. This isn't, it's not just who we put in the Oval Office is like a small thing. I mean, mm-hmm. people's lives are literally impacted every single second of this day and threatened. So that's that's a hard thing, I, I think, to, to, to think about all the time. <laughs> um I I would expect to see, you know, I think the pendulum swung one way a little more than we had seen a while with the Obama administration, um, which for a lot of us was really great. Still some challenges within that. Um, and I think this is somewhat of a reaction to that mm-hmm. in that it's kind of pushing to the other way. So I... It'll be interesting. I don't know. I don't think I can predict what what politics will look like because I don't I don't know that I saw us getting here. The things mm-hmm. that the, the impact I saw us getting to. I mean, I we have legislators that can 
make those things happen and do try to to make things happen, um, like getting rid of DACA or, you know, different things like that. But I don't know that I saw us having the face of our country (laughs) so blatantly sexist and racist. I don't know that I anticipated that. Um, Once we were in it, I was like, oh, he's going to win. People really believe this. Oh man, I didn't. I didn't see him winning. I didn't. Oh, see I went. Him. I knew it. I was like, "Yep, this yeah. is this is this is where we are." And I should have. And the and the thing is, um, but maybe I shouldn't have. And I think one of the things um, that's a uh, misfortune for for our our this entire country. Is that, I mean, we, we, we pick, we pick the leader of the executive branch on like a popularity contest, which doesn't make sense. Why, why would you, when would you ever choose a leader based on popularity contests? Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, I'd say. Well, that didn't um, even truly happen. Yeah. Well, in what happened in, in Reagan, um, you know, as an actor used a lot of his guile to be able to do that. And Bill Clinton was very, uh, uh, you know, persuasive showed up on Arsenio Hall playing the saxophone, and then um, I remember hearing people saying, "Oh, I could have a beer with George Bush Jr." Right, and then we hit the huge, huge populist wave with Barack Obama, mm-hmm. which in some ways led that. Because I mean, really think about it: with Donald Trump, his last job was The Apprentice. Like his last job was Celebrity Apprentice. Can like Kenny, I was listening to the radio today, and they were saying that um, – uh, oh, it was Howard Dean speaking, and um, they played a clip of him saying that, like, who who do you think could run uh, in, in 2020? He mentioned this mayor, the mayor of L.A., and he says, like, well, Donald Trump b- broke the mold, so really mayors are going to try to run for it. Seems like in, in a good way, almost everyone can run, but in a bad way. And I would say, unfortunately, with uh, Obama's populism – that so many of us um there was there's any even backlash to his populism mm-hmm. and just like the the birther stuff and just all the constant attacks on those things i felt like it really and i don't remember who said this but this is an original idea and i forget who said it but said like what that really limited us is the ability to have um like normalized critiques of him because there's lots of things obama did that i just i did not like i did not like at all Mm -hmm. most deportations of any president ever um but so many of us couldn't have those normalized critiques because there are people who were saying well he's not even born in this country or Mm -hmm. um or he's a secret muslim um i love i love that that just line of, of thinking oh he's a secret muslim atheist you know who's who was sent here from Kenya to do that. And you have to realize, like, those people exist in this country. Mm-hmm. And they have as much right to vote as you do. So, I just, what, what I, is, what, but what, what is the solution to, to that? Because if they have the same right to vote as you do, do you make it so they can't vote? Or do you have to do, do you do, like, a, a test uh, uh, to do that, but there's already a dark history inside of there, and voter suppression already exists inside of this country, so what is what is the solution? I think the solution to that is people being as passionate about their local politics as they are with the president. Man, I have, I have um, tried because to get passionate that, about local politics. We will never see, you know, just even think here in Omaha, under um, the Obama administration, still had a lot of challenges Mm -hmm. Um, because we just don't have politicians that are truly willing to look at what the lives are like for all people in their states or cities. Mm -hmm. Um, And we, we need to look at that. And and I the voting turnout for local politics is abysmal, crappy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's just it's just really shitty. Uh, and so I don't, you know, I think that that's something that we really have to to get people. And I and I will tell you, 
before I was educated, when I first started voting, I would pick who had the most signs out, who did I usually mm. see. And now, typically, those are the people I don't even want to vote for. Yeah. <laughs> um, because they have more signs because they have access to money. Yeah. And they have access to the different systems that are continuing to oppress me every day. Mm-hmm. And so it... You know, we also need to to teach people how to vote, what that looks like. We say, get out and vote, get out and vote, get out and vote all the time. But what the hell does that mean? What are, so true. What are people voting for? You know, and, and something that I'm just... It doesn't make sense. It, it shouldn't make sense. Because right now what we have is we have two teams, then everyone else. And yeah. there's things that are connected that shouldn't be connected. So if I, if I choose a person... And um, I hear what what side they're on, whether they consider themselves a Republican or a Democrat. There's things that shouldn't be related that are are things like so. What is your view on climate change? What is your um, what is your view on birth control? What is your view on uh, the death penalty? Those things should be independent, right? You shouldn't be able to predict one from the other, but you almost can. And so you have to wonder what is happening to our country that things are so clearly divided right now and people are becoming more entrenched inside of those. But something else I wanted to to bring up um, is that me and you, and speaking of local politics, is like I, I try to be very informed. I try to vote my way. But I realize that I am a statistical outlier and, mm-hmm. and so are you. We are um, people of color inside of the city – that are uh, that are middle class and and upwardly mobile, and though that is a, those are statistical outliers here in this city, yeah, in in Omaha, and that's kind of a dark thing to think about, right? That's kind of a, a dark thing to think about that, and I never really noticed that as much until I visited um, for work Little Rock, Arkansas, uh-huh. uh, and I saw people. I, and to be frank, I saw black people who who came from very wealthy families, and for me that was strange. And I was like, "Oh my god! Like, where's like that's such a racist thought? Where did that come from, right?" Yeah. And I thought like I grew up in a city where I never once met someone who was rich and black until I was already an adult. Just didn't didn't exist. So in some ways, I feel very passionate about the ways that I feel, but also I realize that like I'm kind of living in a society right now that just isn't built for me. It's not built for people like me. And I will say that there is um, – for Latinos here in, in Omaha, they're, they're doing the revitalization. They're building the things to try to start retaining people. Uh, there are me around 30 uh, middle-class job, no children. Those, they're popping up now. They're popping up now. Um, but I guess from, from your view in these local, cause here's another thing is like all these local politicians, I've never really seen them reach out. I've seen them pander. Mm-hmm. I've seen them pander so much and nothing gets my blood boiling, like pandering when Hillary Clinton's people came here to talk to the, um, I got invited to come to the, uh, democratic Latino caucus and Hillary Clinton people came here and man, were they, were they just pandering? They were doing a victory lap. They were just very... They didn't take our answers, uh, or, or excuse me, our questions seriously, and I just it left me with a, it was just a terrible, terrible taste in my mouth. So with these local politics, I don't know. Maybe we'll help do the two person focus group. We can help them out. Is like what what issues do you actually care about here that would like get you to vote for someone here at a local level? Yeah, no, I mean I think getting the issues out there and getting people educated on the issues. I mean I don't care how people vote um i mean i i I do obviously but (laughs) but i don't you know in the sense that i it's somebody's right to be able to vote how they want to vote Mm -hmm. um and i support that but i want to know why people vote for what they're voting for so when i ask somebody you know why did you vote for donald trump and the answer is just because i hate hillary Mm-hmm. Okay. Do you, what other reasons are there? Were there policies that stuck out to you? Were there issues that were addressed that you really thought was important? Is there something that you know? What is it? What what aspect um, of his presidency did you feel like would be a good fit? And that's not a, a confrontive question. 
And so I think providing people the knowledge to be able to talk about why they're voting for what they're voting for, I think some people just don't vote because they don't know what that means. Mm-hmm. Not voting, but they don't know, you know, if I vote yes for this tax, do, does that impact me? Does mm-hmm. that not? If yeah. I say, yeah, I want that arena to be built, does that have any impact on me? Or is it just <laughs> that that's a cool thing that will be in our mm-hmm. city? You know, like, we mm-hmm. don't know these things. We don't educate on these things. So so really just starting at that basic level of, of holding people accountable. Also, we have politicians that go into areas of our city and assume certain people are the the gatekeepers that just do not reflect Mm -hmm. the best interest of those Mm -hmm. folks. And I know listeners (laughs) know, like, certain people that, that that in multiple communities, you know, that can, that hold that title. So we need to speak up about those things. Mm -hmm. I think we get fearful of that because those are the people that have power to speak on issues that impact us. But unless we're saying, hey, no, that person's opinion actually doesn't reflect my opinion. Here's my opinion. Um, Until we, as people, decide that we want to speak up for issues that impact us, we're always going to have... You know, some a lot of times the way they are. Yeah, sometimes I feel sometimes I feel very hopeful for the city, and then sometimes <laughs> I don't. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that always, one of the things that that just grinds my gears is that it's just such a it, it's a city that always seems like ten fifteen years behind the curve. We mm-hmm. just can't. And I, I felt that way um, with marriage equality here. I remember. Really, the the pushes even for the uh, equal employment ordinances that were here, and just like the just the pushback, the big pushback, and even when when the tide had turned, and and like most people in the city said, yeah, we want marriage equality, it just it just ground to a halt until something federal happened, and I just thought like, oh my god, is that like what this is? Is that what the city is about? And it really seems that that's what it is. is they never be the the first ones out front to to get in front for the people it's always super super reactive and for those of you who don't know about equal opportunity ordinance you may want to look up to see if it's in your city right and all that means is that you can't be fired based on your uh sexual orientation gender identity or gender expression um and there was there is a hard fat fought bottle here in um hard fought battle here in uh omaha for that and I even know the one in Lincoln got uh, repealed. Um, is that correct? I don't want to speak out of turn. Did the one in Lincoln, the equal uh, employment ordinance, get I repealed in Lincoln? I do not believe that Lincoln okay. has one. I think yeah, Omaha I, is the only city I, that I has believe, one. Which is We've tried as a state multiple times. Um, yeah, but it's an at-will state also, meaning that you can be fired for any reason at any time. So I don't think people realize that. As what it does is it doesn't prevent you from being fired what it means is that you can you can then bring a lawsuit for wrongful termination based on that but i would say even for i don't know how old were you when all that was was going on oh, i don't even know with the marriage for marriage equality when when, when did marriage equality pass? it seems like so long ago it seems like oh yeah that just happened but that was like in our lifetime right it was, it was just a couple it was years very ago. recently like Four and years it, ago, maybe? and you'd like to believe that like people are out for human rights and things like that, but just just how short a time and how long it took people to realize that that should be the law of the land, and then even the uphill battle on that, right? Mm-hmm. So, I don't know what was what was life like for you around that time. Um, I wish we could see facial expressions on, yeah. on this thing. Right, it's all <laughs> it's a lot of thought in your eyes right there. <laughs> yeah, I just went multiple places. Yeah, but, um, I think. Once again, I when you say this, I still, and I know I'm not really answering the question, but I think a lot about impact once again, and, and I talk about this all the time, and I think people get annoyed with that, but that's what we choose not to see. We understand an issue. We understand that something is is a problem, but we don't understand what that impact is. So with marriage equality, 
I had people around me that would say things like, well, (laughs) you've seen my marriage. Marriage sucks. Why would you want to do this? Mm -hmm. And that's great. I'm not married and I don't want to be married right now. But the fact that somebody is telling me you are legally not allowed to get married, Mm -hmm. that to me is a problem. Especially when I can say other people legally have that ability. So for me, it was a time of um, celebration and excitement because I I felt like it's a step towards recognizing that we do give different rules for people that are, quote unquote, not the norm. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that for me was a breaking of that box. But I also, as a social worker and somebody that is definitely embedded in the social justice world, I see a lot of other challenges. And so sometimes it's hard for me to, I need to remind myself to take a win. When Mm -hmm. there's a win, take that win. Because for me, my first step was, well, great, we have marriage equality, but you know, our trans community are still being treated like shit, even by our own people. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I'm always, like, (laughs) moving on to the next step. And so sometimes I have to remind myself to to take a step back and appreciate the win when we had it. There were a lot of aspects of President Obama's um, presidency that, that I appreciated. And sure, there were a lot of things that were challenges as well. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that that's fair, but I think just for issues being brought forward that impacted my life and meant something to me, we were forced to talk about them as a society. And that was very important to me. And, and looking back, I think I took it, I took that for granted a bit. Um, and I'm always pushing to what that next issue is. So I have to remind myself sometimes to to stop for a second. Now I'm not, those that know me know that I'm not going to stop, stop. Yep. <laughs> um, I'm going to yield and take a moment to appreciate what we have accomplished. Because without that, we lose that energy and momentum to keep going. And also remember what people before us have accomplished to provide me an opportunity where I am today. Um, so I think that's that's kind of where I was at that time, is just trying to provide myself an opportunity to reflect on, on the things that were great, but of course thinking about the 10 other things that that we had to address next. And, and once again, I think that's another thing that makes my experience interesting in that, you know, I'm part Cuban, part black, um, identify as a queer person, you know, I'm a social worker and a female dominated, um, field. And in this city, a white female dominated field. Mm-hmm. So, so for me, there's a lot of intersections that are impacted every day. So just cause one part of me is, is a step forward to liberation. There's other parts of me that are still 10 steps back. And so it's hard for me to, to get really excited when I don't have true liberation. I, as a person don't see every aspect of my identity, um, respected and acknowledged and provided the same equitable opportunities as others that's that's where where i struggle so so that's why i'm always that a couple feet ahead because i'm like okay yep Mm -hmm. like that's nice that we did that but what about this 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 and you know um ashley spivey um here in omaha does amazing work around that like really talking about liberation you know we talk a lot about equity work and I don't know that us as people are, I don't think everybody as a society is, is at that place yet of truly understanding equity. Um, but she's always challenging that notion of, of liberation, true liberation versus equity. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, and I like that. I, I, I appreciate that, 
that push because I agree that's where we really need to be. Um, and so that's why I'm always that push, you know, there's other pieces of me that are impacted that I have to be looking out for and other people, other pieces of people that I love and care about. Here's something again, I think I'm glad to have you here today just, uh, cause I think you're, I, I really appreciate your perspective on this. Cause there's another question that I ping around, um, <laughs> in my head a lot. So there has been a lot, there was this big push for, and some big push back about, uh, and this phrase that really has become demonized, um, and that is identity politics, right? Identity politics. And the pushback has been, um, well, why do we always have to talk about people based on identities mm-hmm. this, this way and that way? But then to hear you speak very passionately about saying there's mm-hmm. pieces of your identities that you feel still aren't, aren't there. And I feel like that uh, the message on either side isn't, isn't getting through. But um, there's this great, great, great documentary. Um, God, what, what in the world is it, is it named? It's, it's like a bunch of uh, – it's like a men's retreat, uh, retreat that they put in there. And they have uh, men of, of different ethnicities, and they're talking to each other. Mm-hmm. Um, God, I wish I could remember what it is. I'm going to be so upset uh, when, I, <laughs> when I can't do it. But um, Just put it in the comments. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they, but at one point, um, the, um, this man who's black there, and I actually um, – Victor Lee Lewis is his name. I actually got to attend a session of his once a few years ago. Um, becomes pretty upset and angry and, and says that when when you say, why can't we just ignore race, what you're trying to say is you come here to me to make me comfortable. You come, you act like me, you talk like me, you, and that's the only way that, that I'm ever going to respect you is if you were exactly like me, but you know I can't go there, and you know that I'll never be able to go there. And so I think for some people, they say like, well, I'm doing... I don't focus on on my race or my gender or on these things. So why is it such a big deal to you? Why don't you just stop thinking about mm-hmm. that? Um, and well, I know, also, and I know for me that like when I hear things like that, it's like nails on a chalkboard to me. <laughs> yeah. Um, but go ahead. What are you gonna? Say? I think we only talk about that when it comes to um, race and ethnicity Mm -hmm. because once again, then we have to recognize that that it truly does play an impact. But I speak passionately about my identities because they are a factor in everything that I do every day. Mm -hmm. Um, I am my identity. And a lot of that came from losing or pieces of my identity, not being acknowledged. People see me and, and they see black or they think I'm black with black with mixed and with white and I lose that that Cuban aspect which I didn't grow up with a black parent I grew up with a Cuban parent Mm -hmm. and and a white parent and the and that Cuban aspect is literally in my blood but people don't recognize it because I don't speak Spanish or because I don't fit what they think Cuban looks like Mm -hmm. um so I talk about it because it's important to me. I mean, my identity is that I'm always very passionately open about is just being black, Cuban, like queer and a social worker. Like those are pieces that embody who I am as a person. Um, so I, I do take a lot of offense when people say things like I don't see color or <laughs> um, they say things like, well, identity doesn't matter. You should just be able to. Mm-hmm. Well, identity does matter because that's who I am. Um, but not only is that who I am, that is how the world sees me. Mm-hmm. And they act on their perception of what yeah. they're seeing. So I have to be cognizant and aware of that every single day of my life. Um Whereas I don't know that everybody has to. Uh And so that's, you know, yeah, so that's, I don't think it's identity politics to, to talk about who we are. I mean, damn it, I'm black and beautiful. Like, let's, you know, let's talk about it. Um, Sorry, all the cursing. Um, but <laughs> right. it's PG no children. Sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, I hope I hope there's children listening to this. Hopefully, you know, and that's something don't like, repeat the bad words, please. Yeah, here's well, <laughs> that's something I think I could talk about. Also, is something a group of of people I do want to listen to this. Um, at some point, are teenagers because sometimes I forget. I had my my brother's godmother always uh, used to say 
that you never know who's watching you from afar. You yeah. never know who's who's like whose role model you you are, right? Mm-hmm. And I think I never stop and think about that because I'm always um, it's such a hard idea. The idea that I am I could ever be someone's role model or that someone could look up to me. Um, but again, like me and you, we are at least statistical outliers inside of here. And I know for me, and I, I'd kind of like to hear from you how you've done with this is. I recognize that a way that I have dealt with being one of these statistical outliers is that I've just I've learned to be aggressive. Like when I if I'm mm-hmm. in a place and I feel like people aren't taking me seriously either because the color of my skin or my height or things like that, I just like okay, well now I am I'm gonna like I I feel like I have to stand up for myself. I feel like I have to assert myself mm-hmm. a lot stronger because but really all that comes from insecurity or pain or, mm-hmm. or things like that. And I think that's also one of the reasons that I've... Or societal well, messages on how you should react yeah, to things as well, a cis male. And I, yeah, <laughs> and I've, I've, and I, I've mentioned this on the podcast before. It's like, when I get nervous, I read a lot about things and I always, and I realize that for all of you thinking, you're just like, oh, geez, that sounds like someone who needs to be in control all the time. Well, probably. <laughs> like, and that's, and you know, as, as well as I, I do. I diagnose you. Yeah, when you, when you go into, when you go into therapy, when, when you do therapy, Mm-hmm. There's a special type of suffering of where you can like see the things inside yourself, but but you have enough cognitive dissonance that you don't know how to like get behind it or get around it. <laughs> so I know all these things about myself, but and I think all of that is just a response to. And this is something that I mean, someone take this business idea because I'd love to see this happening. But one day, if I ever uh, decide to do um, therapy full time, one of the things I'd like to put on there is like the ability to help with with. Um, identity-based trauma right so things like that and i know i have some identity-based trauma based on the color of my skin uh based on just other things like that and so i don't know for for you how you deal with it because i realize that is like my my thing is like i either have to be in control or i try to like leave and that's only those are those are the very the very ends of of the bell curve of the things of that i would do but i recognize that those are like coping strategies for myself do you do you recognize any of those inside of yourself, like what you do? Um, I try to be pretty upfront and blunt about things, or I like to put people in really awkward mm-hmm. <laughs> situations where I just mm-hmm. ask questions and I will play dumb and be like, I'm not sure what you mean by that. I've or never, or can you oh, can God. you further explain that to me? Because it's so funny to me to watch people... Uh-huh have to now explain mm-hmm. the crappy thing that they're doing. Yeah. Like, that to me, I just get so much joy out of that. I don't. It so makes I my think, skin crawl seeing people be awkward like that. Oh, but... I love it. Because, mm-hmm. and maybe that's the therapist in me. Like, I can sit there in complete awkward silence. Yeah, I... um, <laughs> you know, I might say something like, uh-huh. okay, so what I'm hearing is, and then I'll, like, repeat back what they're saying, and mm-hmm. all my friends are probably laughing right now because yeah. I say that all the time. Um... So I think that's how I handle with handle things. I'm not one to get really angry. Now, if I see it happen to other people, I get I get frustrated and angry. Mm-hmm. But happening to me, I have a weird calmness and patience about that. Now, I'm starting to get to a place, especially when it comes to race and ethnicity, that I am losing my patience. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that has been noticeable for me but I don't know and you were kind of talking about therapy with impact of um, your identity and I work with a lot of folks who identify as trans or just really anywhere in the LGBT umbrella and a fair number of people of color and that's a lot of what we talk about but I and I mostly work with I don't know teens and young adults so like I guess my youngest is like 12 but Mm -hmm. usually you know 15 to 25 ish and and a lot of that is just navigating the world but I have a couple rules in my space and that is that they get to be in charge of that space Mm -hmm. and that I'm not going to force them to talk about anything that they don't want to talk about And I may circle back to it, but I'm not going to force them to talk about it. And simple things like that have actually had such a huge, profound impact on on how they're doing 
within the therapy setting or out in the world because that's what we don't give youth Mm -hmm. or young people. We don't give them an opportunity to just speak their mind exactly how they want to speak their mind. We don't give them the opportunity to show that they actually understand things and they they know more than we think that they know, both Mm -hmm. because, like you mentioned, they pick a lot up, but also they're not stupid. These issues also impact them as people. And so I would love to see a young person like, or hear a young person on your show, actually. Um, I think that would be something that, and really providing that voice because we don't do that. We don't give those outlets. We don't give those opportunities. Um, And there's a lot of people that are advocating on behalf of youth, but a lot of some of those people aren't actually consulting or working with youth Mm -hmm. and really uplifting them. So I think it gets twisted with identity. and, And I think that's where some of that trauma comes from is that people feel very used and abused and they don't feel important unless we want something from them. Um, And that's just the challenge of different identities. Wow. And that's something I guess that I've, I've heard a lot about also, but hearing put it that way, it's just, it is a big wow. Uh, There is, and you mentioned something about local politics a bit earlier. Mm -hmm. Um, And I guess the the word would be tokenism of Mm -hmm. that tokenism is like you said, it's like, it's almost, we don't care about that unless we can use it for something. And that's something that I've noticed a lot in media lately Uh is that they're, they they're really trying to get in on that because they recognize the youth are are leaning more confidently into their identities, uh-huh. and some of them some of them are doing unapologetically okay. too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And so some shows are trying to pick up on that and do that, but then you get things like the um, is it Kendall Jenner with the with the with the Pepsi commercial. Right. Oh, Do you remember that yeah. with uh, and it's like when when all of these major like civil unrest and things are, are happening, it's just like Pepsi's like, I got a great idea. And it just <laughs> and it just missed the mark completely. But so some places are doing it well and some it goes exactly back to what I was saying before is that pandering. I have noticed um, in a lot of my Latino youth that I work with. There's still this idea that they they a lot of them personally don't feel like they are quote unquote true Americans, right? Is that there is like white people are true Americans and mm-hmm. then there's them. Right. And I and also don't even know different. what that truly means. Yeah. I think oh my god, I heard <laughs> like yeah, that's hey, a whole different I think that's someone, a whole different thing, but I don't Yeah. So, I don't even actually know what that means. Yeah, I to heard people. on the news someone said something, uh something, something, blah 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 our our traditions as as americans and like when you think of it like look at the united states is only 200 some years old like that is in the terms of the world of the world that is infinitely small like i remember uh when donald trump was was a candidate i hate that we keep circling back to him but he's like it's weird because he's gonna be a cultural landmark like our uh like i know i'll have like grandchildren that like they have to write a report in like seventh or eighth grade and that's about Donald Trump, and I'll be very passionate about it, and they'll just be like, yeah, whatever, who get, you know, it's not important. <laughs> but anyway, when Donald Trump was a candidate, he was saying that he was going to label China as a currency manipulator, and that they, and that uh, climate change was a Chinese hoax, and how he was really going to hold uh, China accountable for all these things, mm-hmm. and how China was going to fail all these things. And China came back with, like, the most brutal response I have I think I've ever seen on like a a geopolitical level. And they said that the United States is just uh, a flash in the pan. I figure exactly how they say it, but it's just a flash in the pan. And that China, China's culture and government have persisted for 8,000 years and they will be here long after the United States. And I just thought, Oh Jesus. Like that is, yeah, I know because like, yeah, that's 8,000 years. 8,000 years. When I was in Mexico City last year, um, I had a family member uh, said they had someone from, from Egypt uh, come visit who's a friend. And they went by a, a building and it said – on the building it said like established 1776. And he asked – this person asked, why is that number on there? And they said, oh, it's because it's a historical building. And they said, yeah, but why is it on there? And he said, oh, it's just show it's really old. And he said, my family has furniture that's older than that. Right, it, mm. in in Egypt. So when you think about 
the idea that we have this culture in the United States that we have to preserve. We are building this culture right now. And I think what we're hitting at this moment is the crossroads between um, monoculturalism of what has existed before and then this idea of um, multiculturalism, or I think more more accurately, pan-culturalism in the sense that if we want to create a, a country, a land, a culture that is accepting of of all people from different cultures, I, I think, you know, there's always going to be the shakeup of cultures. Uh, something wins out, something doesn't. Um, you can even, and the thing that I think is easiest, most palatable, um, this is a pun, most palatable to people is food, right? Is that you see there's certain foods that, that kind of make it to the mainstream culture things like tacos of one, tacos of already one, tacos <laughs> like, like the question of like what part of Mexican culture makes it in, tacos are a clear winner, right? Because you'll see tacos of all kinds of things. But things like sauerkraut, they, they're they here, but you're not going to see – yeah, on the, you're not going to see in the corner someone selling sauerkraut uh, you know, on a, in a stand. No one's saying, oh, we can get tacos. No, there's a sauerkraut stand right oh, they now. They serve them on yeah. hot dogs outside. Yeah, yeah. So – but with oh, yeah. that, we have to ask the hard questions mm-hmm. of what happens to those pieces of culture that aren't widely spread. Do we – either disallow or discourage people from doing that on their own well for a lot of things no we accept they'll do that but are there some pieces of culture that we all agree no we we will not allow that well and i think what when people talk about how the united states is a melting pot and how amazing that is Mm -hmm. um when we force assimilation that is not to me embracing different cultures so i don't know that we are or will ever be what we truly say we want it to be well, and i, I guess some the... people are going to have something to say about that yeah, <laughs> but, sure. well... but i mean i just i just think we allow people to be to experience their culture and live their culture to a point as long as they fit within certain guidelines of what we expect quote unquote American culture to look like mm-hmm. um and there's that assimilation aspect that that we require and expect of people in order to be that so it's kind of like one of it's for me it's almost like giant tokenism. Like, Mm -hmm. oh, we just want to say that we have people of different um, ethnicities and religions, but we don't really want to give them a voice or allow them an opportunity to be successful. Mm -hmm. We just want to say we have them. Yeah. And we, God. See why I'm passionate about talking about that? (laughs) Yeah, it is, it is, it is such a good, it's such a a good thing to keep bringing up i think because i feel like we're running culturally we're running on the topics now of uh again of race and identity and things like that but i don't know where we're running to yeah right i don't um, i would agree the one thing that and i just wasn't i didn't grow up talking about identity and social justice, things like that. I didn't grow up in this era with it. I was taught, and people have heard me say this before, I was taught by people who were, who learned this in the 70s. And so the really, um, the call-out culture is just, it's it's not as palatable to me. Yeah. I get why it exists. Mm-hmm. I, I get it. I just, it's not me, though, right? Mm-hmm. I've, and it's just my yeah, personal. When you taste. say call out culture, what what do you mean to that in reference? Because I think Good. I think where yeah. where people tend to go to is is um, civil rights work and compare things to that. Yeah. But what do you mean by? So what I mean by culture? that is that, and I see it all the time, uh, just because the people that I'm friends with on Facebook, like. Um, I'll give an example. Um, so I follow someone uh, 
on on I don't follow them. I'm friends with them on Facebook, and I've never met this person in real life. They sent me a request, and I think it's just because they saw me at some events, and um, they're pretty active in protests and and things like mm-hmm. that. But I also just saw just just loves loves putting people on front street right so Mm -hmm. uh this person said like don't trust so and so and name the person immediately says they're a liar and a snake and Mm -hmm. they're only trying to get influence in a democratic party here Mm -hmm. to their own gain right and so when i see that i like it's just not my style but that's useful information to me mm-hmm. also, right? And the thing is, like, I'll at least keep that in mind going forward because I've interacted with that person they were talking about, and I wouldn't I wouldn't disagree with that assessment, but I wouldn't kind of put them out in front like that. But it is such a useful tool for people who otherwise wouldn't have that much power. And I, I here's another example. There was... Um, and, I, and I'm sure you, you've you heard of this before. There's this website uh, started by someone that I, I'm pretty sure we, we both know. And the idea was for them to report, um, anonymously report um, occurrences of, of sexual harassment in the community, right? And, and I saw that and I thought, yes, that could serve a purpose. But also, is it dangerous to, to do that, to be able to put someone's name out? And I mean... Now, here's the thing. is Socially, we can say dangerous or not, but also it, it leads to possible legal, legal ramifications with um, – Slander. Sl- or, or libel if, mm-hmm. it's on, if it's on the website. True. Yeah. Um, but and I, and I struggle with that because in, in some ways, if used correctly, it gives power to people who wouldn't normally have that power. Mm-hmm. But if used incorrectly, you can really um, unfairly damage someone's life. Yeah, no, and I and I agree with aspects of that. You know, I think it's um, I speak a lot about intention and impact, and and really speaking and acting through intention and recognizing what that impact might be. So, those are two things I try to always be mindful of. I'm super mindful of the words that I use and how I use them. Um, I think also, um recognizing that like i said before we as a society have been hiding or providing more opportunities to subliminally be racist or or just sexist or just hold people back and i think part of that is a reaction to that um now these tactics aren't any different than they were used during the civil rights movement, but I think we see it more often because people are having a hard time dealing with the fact that it's not an outward expression as much anymore. People mm-hmm. don't see it in their face all the time. So I also don't blame people for that reaction. Also, I think social media <laughs> provides an opportunity for people to hide behind their words. Once again, we don't expect people that stand in front of others and say, mm-hmm. this is how I feel. But anything that I would put on social media or say on a radio show or anything like that, um, or a podcast, like I would say to somebody's face, <laughs> like it's not mm-hmm. anything mm-hmm. that I'm fearful of. But, you know, I think it's a reaction. It's a reaction to the culture we built. It's a reaction to, to the way that things are we have to we have to stand up for it but i also think there's a place for calling people out i think there's a place for saying um and i and for me i have a problem when we start calling out character mm-hmm. i have a problem when we start saying just awful things about people versus saying this is a policy that somebody supports or mm-hmm. this is actions an That's action that they mm-hmm. took that impacted people in this way Um, I am not going to be somebody who's sitting here and labeling people, but I might say, Hey, this individual is responsible for this piece of legislation, which had this impact. Mm -hmm. And I don't have a problem saying that because if it's true, it's true. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I agree. We have to be thoughtful and mindful about things, but I'm also as much trouble as I've had in embracing calling out as well. I I don't think I will ever be at a place where I say that people shouldn't do it because um, I agree with you. I think there's a place and it can be helpful. Yeah, I don't know. I 
And I think that that's the true statement I could say is if there's another name for this podcast, it'd be I don't know. Because so <laughs> – and I think it, I feel very lucky in that very, very routinely I get to places of where I feel like I just don't – I don't know what the next logical step is. Yeah. And, I, and that usually for me means that I'm heading in the right direction because mm-hmm. I don't want to – be in the place where I think I know all the answers because I know that as strong as I hold convictions about whatever topic, there's someone who has the as strong conviction on the opposite side. And both of us can justify why our side is the best. And so I, I really just want – and that's the, the goal of this podcast is really to show that like humans are wide and they have a wide variety of thoughts. So um, – I guess the last note to 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 end on on all this is as we, as we talk about identities like my goal for this podcast is like I want I started off with people that I I I knew that um I could get interesting conversations out with and I knew that we aligned more or less in some ways but the goal is at some point is to start talking to people that I know that I I disagree with mm-hmm. and one thing that I really struggled with and maybe you can at least help me out with with some of my thought is that a criticism I might I might get, and maybe this is a surprise for some of the listeners, but I know well. I know that for at least the, some of the people that are listening uh, to this right now, who are um, people of color or are very much more progressive, as soon as I bring like a, a white man on here, and I have a couple of, of people that I know, a white man is they're gonna have the criticism of just like, well, what makes this person special? They're just another white guy with their plain white guy opinions. Um, but in some way, I I want to talk to some people I know and maybe some people I don't know and at least get some of these ideas out there uh, for people to hear. Like these are these are your neighbors. These are the people around you. These maybe are some of your bosses or maybe these are some of your workers. So um, – and I've heard – you know, and I've heard some people lament and, it, and for me, it's just kind of like, OK, we'll, we'll join the party. People lament saying that like, oh, it's hard being white now. It's like, OK, well – well, and I, I think mean, that comes from a place of providing them a platform mm-hmm. is what I would guess that people mm-hmm. feel. Is that exactly. You, it's providing them a platform that they already have. Yeah. So, um, and yeah. it's kind of the idea of just like, well, we've, we've already heard white men's opinions. Yeah. But in, it's a good in, conversation, though. Yeah. Well, and I, it, it'll just be something that I address at the time there because, you know, you can't can't make everyone happy all the time. And what I have to keep saying is like, this is... For me, this is is a journey. I want to hear from as many unique people as as possible. And I know eventually I'm going to screw up. I'm going to say something wrong. One of my <laughs> guests is going to like drop a slur of some sort. And I'm going to be like, oh, do I say something? Do I not say something? Because if I say something right now, maybe it will derail the whole thing. And I guess what I'm trying to do is make everyone happy because I want to be able to push the envelope. But I also want people to... Um, feel comfortable as a guest here, but I also want people to think that I'm asking interesting questions, but I also want people to to think that I'm giving the guests a fair chance. And so I don't I don't have the perfect formula for, mm-hmm. for what it's going to look like, but I guess... Um, I love that notion of just having conversation and mm-hmm. the opportunity. I love hearing from people that have a different opinion because it just helps you solidify why you do or maybe don't feel the way that yeah. you do, so... Yeah, and I know I like, like the e- format. eventually someone's gonna hurt my feelings on air. <laughs> also, like I know it's I know it's gonna happen at some point, and I just we'll see what happens when I get when we get there. Good but luck. yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> well, and um, gosh, there's, there's a whole another topic that I'd love to bring up to you another time. So here will be the first topic for the next time we come together. Uh, is is it a market for people of color to sell their suffering? So that's that's the next the next topic for for the mm. next time because I I re posted mm. this thing I think on Facebook that said like said like I've read college essays and every single person of color uh, I've has has talked about like their their trauma and so are people of color just selling their uh, trauma to white people in order to get that because you know I've read scholarship mm. essays before and I will say like yes almost every single uh, person that mentioned being a person of color mentioned say I'm a person of color and here's how it's made my life hard. Mm. So big topic, big big topic. We'll, we'll have to do this again. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to do this again sometime soon. Thanks so much for 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 coming in today. Yeah, thank you for having me. I really appreciated it. All right, cool. We did it. Yay. Woo. We it survived. Was, it was so-
Yeah, how long has it been? 